The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Welcome, old-time radio lovers to the Boxcars 7-Eleven Old-Time Radio Pod. I am Bob Camardella, your host, and for the next hour or so, your guide, as we travel back in time, back before TV was, to the golden age of radio. I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to the Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your imagination. This week, Bill S. Ballinger's sung portrait of an unlikely hero. The Air Hunters. Starring Ken Berry. Joanne Worley. And Edgar Bergen. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Zero Hour. Sponsored in part by Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, the makers of Delco Batteries and Bear Aspirin. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. Repentant redhead. Dean Quinn has been trying to locate Helen Martin, missing heiress to a hidden fortune. He's been fishing for clues, but to this point has caught only a good case of pneumonia. He meets Virginia Clay, Helen Martin's aunt, who sends him back to California into a post office box. Dean Quinn back in California, back to his girl, Beth Temple, and into the fire, brought upon by the arrival of the irrepressible Stella Pasek from Chicago. But it's the business of air hunting that Dean Quinn has chosen, so he follows the trail north to San Francisco, then back to Los Angeles, to the mansion of the young and beautiful, mysterious Florenzia Monti, but still not a trace of Helen Martin. He has no idea where or even who she is, nor for that matter does he know exactly how he got to where he is, in the swimming pool, half drowned and bleeding, and not alone. His company is dead. Murdered. Dean Quinn wants to know in a word why. The Air Hunters resumes after this message. Hi, this is Buddy Merrill from the Lawrence Wolf Band. And I'd just like to say if you're a veteran just returning to civilian life, the Veterans Administration urges you to take advantage of your rights under the GI Bill. If you need additional education, you may have as much as 36 months of schooling coming to you. If you haven't finished high school, you may do so and still have your full GI school time coming to you for college or other education. You get paid every month while you work toward your diploma. So, why not get on with that GI schooling? Don't let the opportunities that could be yours pass you by because you aren't prepared. Don't let the rights you earn while in uniform go on you. This is Buddy Merrill saying, get full information from VA. Get started in school under the GI Bill and follow the road to success that millions of veterans have taken. I pulled myself out of the pool and staggered into the living room. It was a mess, a disaster area. It looked worse than my head felt. Whoever had bopped me and had killed her. Come on, boy, oh, remember it all or they'll get you for sure. Uh, water. The harbor. Uh, water. What, what am I thinking of? The McAllister. I went to the pier to talk to Albert Chris about Edgar Ryan. Sure, I knew Edgar Ryan. I often wondered what happened to him. Last saw him maybe 15 years ago. He was second engineer aboard the Sulu Sea, tanker older than Noah's Ark. 
I was on her, too, as an A.B. Do you have more coffee? Uh, no, no thanks, Mr. Kessler. Well, we picked up a cargo of crude in the Persian Gulf, sailed up to the Red Sea to the Med, and played over in Istanbul a couple of days, and sailed back to the States. We got held up at customs when we berthed in Jersey. ship was swarming with treasury men. They'd been tipped off that we'd picked up some junk in Turkey. Point I'm making, Ryan left the ship there in Jersey. Well, what was odd was he'd signed on from the West Coast. You mean he deserted? No, no, he just drew his pay and walked off. Didn't say goodbye or go to hell. I drove back to face Walden again. I thought maybe what Cress had told me might perk him up a little. Well, we were sort of... So involved. what? Well, I don't think old Ryan was in on the smuggling from the start, but he knew that engine room and everything in it. He found where the stuff was hidden, quit the ship, and walked off with a couple of tobacco tins of pure morphine. I won't condone that. A hundred thousand dollars from dope, salted away in little bank accounts under different names. The government will attach those accounts when they're revealed in probate. No, they won't. They'd only be guessing. There's absolutely no proof. Besides, there's the statute of limitations. I'm not going to argue with you, Quinn. You got me into this, but I'm getting out now. You can't. We've got a contract for a year. Oh, have we? There's your contract. Uh, want to sue me? So I was canned. On my way out of Walden's office, I asked Nora, his secretary, to refer any telephone calls for me to El Cairo Court. Flat broke again and really down. I went back to Betts. Hello, honey. Stella well, and I have been out shopping. Well, how'd it go at the office today? Oh, great. If you dig getting fired. Oh, Dean. What are you going to do? I don't know. I guess I could go back to passing out handbills. Hey, maybe I could fix you up with a job. One of the boys at the club quit last night. A job doing what? Certain cars. How much? You know, I've been making pretty good bread. You'll do it. So I took it. That night, Beth drove Stella and me to work at the Yodel Le Go Go. It had no parking lot of its own. Steep hills above and steep hills below. I could tell right off it was going to be tough sledding. Stella introduced me to a young dude in a red T-shirt and tight white stretch pants. Gilroy, this here's my very own first cousin, Dean. Stella, I, I don't think that's... He needs the job real bad, and right away I thought of you, Kilroy. <laughs> <laughs> you thought about me? Yeah, he's an awful good driver. And I think you were just so sweet. You, uh, you were... <laughs> How could Kilroy say no? He couldn't say anything at all with his eyes popping out watching Stella slink into the club. Then the suckers began arriving and we, the real suckers, started parking cars. We stashed them all up and down the side streets on both sides of Sunset, anywhere within five blocks. Then we had to whip back to the club on a dead run for the next one. By the time the club closed, it was a basket case. This wasn't a job for someone with chronic pneumonia. Back in El Cairo, I found Beth asleep on the couch. She left me a note explaining why. Dear Chaser, a girl named Nora called to leave a message for you that another girl named Zia wants you to call her in the morning. I think you should know that this is not an answering service and you might think about looking for new pastures to graze in. Let sleeping giants lie, Yes, I know that. I've been making a lot of I met Zia for lunch at the Barrier Reef, a little restaurant on the beach near Malibu. Seems she was interested in buying a paid-up insurance annuity. Could you sell me one? Sure, I guess so. How large an annuity? Oh, $250,000. $250,000? Oh, I want one that will pay me. $10,000 a year for the rest of my life. Yeah, yes. Sure, of course. Well, I, uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll work out the details. Things are going, things are going well with you and me. Future plan together, crystal light together. Things look bright as they can be. We're helping, boys and girls, people. Boys and girls, people. 
Metropolitan Life knows how important the future is to you and your family. We've been preparing hard for the future so that your Metropolitan Representative is qualified to help you prepare for it better. Because the better prepared you are, the better your future will be. I didn't tell Zia I wasn't working for Walden any longer because knowing Walden, I knew he wouldn't turn down the kind of business I had in my pocket. My commission would be somewhere around $7,500, exclusive of what Walden made for overriding it. I swaggered into his office and we drew up another contract. Three days later, I called Zia at home. I must talk to you about the project again. You haven't changed your mind. I don't want to discuss it over the phone. If you could meet me this afternoon, why not drive with me to Palm Springs? We can talk on the way. Boy, oh, this is the way to do business. I've never been out this way before. About that annuity, Dean. I want it in the name of Constance Niles. I thought it was for you. <laughs> of course it's for me. I simply want it in another name. <laughs> Is it so wicked to want to save taxes? Well, uh, no, but I doubt the insurance company will issue to a false name. And Internal Revenue has laws, too. <laughs> All right. But I think I can convince you. If not, perhaps I'll have to cancel the policy. Just checking out the way Zia was built, I didn't need much coaxing. The hideaway was several miles outside of Palm Springs. A sprawling desert adobe, the same color as the sand surrounding it. The place was closed up. No servants were there or anybody. The small cottage, as she called it, was actually a vast ranch house, complete with air conditioning. Zia opened a bottle of champagne and another of brandy and mixed French 75s. We sat on the patio beside the swimming pool, watching the mysterious blue desert night come down. The moon was a huge incandescent globe that pulverized the heavens with powdered light. The whole scene was, was totally surreal. I, I couldn't believe what was happening. Boy, oh, she was really some tomato. By the time we left Palm Springs for Los Angeles the next day, Zia had me convinced. Convinced that if I didn't change the name on the annuity to Constance Niles, I'd lose the sale and never see her again. And I didn't intend to do either. It'll be certainly one thing. This definitely wasn't the kind of thing. Hi, I'm Maybe back. And just there. in Maybe time. Kilroy says you're fired if you don't show up tonight. And after all the humiliation I had to go through to get you the job. I know, dear. Hey, since when have you ladies decided to run my life for me? From now on, I am running my own. I'll pack my stuff and get out. Where are you going? The Century Plaza? And how much money you got? He doesn't have ten dollars. And he'll spend that out chasing girls. It's a good thing he's got you, Beth, to keep an eye on him. Dean, why don't you move back into number nine? Stella can move in with me. No, please. Knock it off. So I moved into number nine, and Stella started camping with Bet. Until my insurance commission came through, I still needed the tips from the parking lot. There was a lousy band playing that night, and business was slow, so I didn't make much money, but at least I kept most of my sweat inside my body. Stella got a ride from that same guy as last time, but in a different car. A shiny new domestic model, about a half a block long, and Kilroy was plenty teed off. Hey, Dave, look at here. He just <laughs> fixed that creep. <laughs> Took it right out of his glove compartment. Kill <laughs> Roy. That's a gun. Yeah. Real pretty, eh? Yaffe Kush don't go into no cheap stuff. Yaffe Kush? Yeah, the jerk drive and Stella home. Big time. Big shot. Civic. You ain't this guy's in the least place this place. Are you out of your mind? You stole a gun from him? He'll come back looking for it. Nah. He's got plenty more. 
Hey, Dee. Be on time tomorrow now, will you? Hey, Kilroy. Look at that broad. Where? Over there, across the street. I don't see no broad. Oh, that's Kilroy. Oh, 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 Kilroy. Oh,
we'll have a You're private a little party in honor of the event. Boy, oh, that sounds terrific. I'll bring the papers. I'll bring the money. $250,000 in cash. Cash? Well, what's wrong with a cashier's check? It'll be safe. I'll keep it under lock and key in my cosmetics box in the trunk of the car. Besides, a cashier's check would involve a bank, and I don't see where it's any of their business, do you? Oh, well, no, no, I guess you're right. See you at eight. Bye now. Yes, ma'am. Pages 150 to 163. The next morning, I rented a car and drove all over town to make sure everything was in perfect running condition. At 6 o'clock, I couldn't sit any longer. You couldn't do the usual routine. I made sure I had the papers and... Oh, no. No, why now? Why me? No. What are you going to do? Well, there's something else, Mr. Clark. I can't kill myself without fumes. The original you can use my car. I won't need it tonight. First matter. Oh, girl, oh, you do that for me. And why did that have to be destroyed? I was almost to the freeway when I thought of something. Bringing all that cash back with me could be dangerous. So I turned up Wilcox and headed towards Sunset in the Strip. Kilroy wasn't there yet, so nobody recognized me when I went looking in the bushes. I found the paper bag with Yoppy's gun, then headed out for Palm Springs. A bit late, but on my way. I thought I could make up some lost time out in the open road, but I made a wrong turn and I was halfway to Indio before a gas station attendant straightened me out. It was almost 9.30 when I made the turn onto the long dirt road. I threaded my set of wheels into the five-car garage attached to the house. The garage was empty except for the stodgy, square, conservative coupe she had driven down in. I parked beside it and got out. As I walked past the car, I remembered the cosmetics case locked in the trunk. Pretty baby. Two hundred and fifty thousand bucks. <laughs> I'll take real good care of you. I meant to tell you, Alan, the police came in here with me. I have to. See, I'm still under arrest for the unlawful entry. Uh, hello? Yes. Okay, Inspector. Zia, it's Mia! Did you get all that? Yes, the car's going to go down in the short end. I walked from the garage around the house to the main entrance. The wind was up. I dodged the tumbleweed that blew across the lawn. The desert cools off fast at night. I hoped it hadn't cooled her off towards me. The lights were on in the living room. So she was here like she promised. I punched the doorbell. Just a tie up the right. ends for you. I stood there quite a while, but no one answered. All the time I was getting impatient, both for Zia and my commission. You know, 33% of nothing is nothing. I knocked on the door, just one little rap, and it swung open. As soon as Janine went into the other room, the potter knows. Anyone here? Out of the closet, shot Rennick, threw the gun At ease, dry your tears. Dean's here. Redhead to take the rap. Uh, hello, uh, anyone home? Was the only way she could get rid of that evidence without attracting suspicion to herself. The living room was empty. That's for Melissa also the dining room, the library, the sunrooms, the kitchen, and the game room. The whole state. joint was deserted. I opened the sliding glass door and stepped outside to the patio and pool. The outdoor lights were off and it was plenty dark. Almost concealed in the darkness by the side of the pool nearest to me, something was bobbing in the water. I stepped to the edge of the pool to take a better look. Oh. Oh. Boy, oh. Zia stared up at me from the water. Her eyes and her mouth were wide open and her hair was matted to the side of her head. Except for the... The features of her face and, and the curled fingers of one outstretched hand or her body was suspended a few inches beneath the surface. I didn't have a chance to see any more because without warning, my arms were pinned behind me and some ape had his hands around my throat. There were two of them, but I couldn't see who they were. Then I got zapped upside my head. Oh! Like I told you, if you're not careful, you can get killed.
You are listening to Mutual's presentation of The Zero Hour. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense, The Air Hunters. I'm Rod Serling, and this is The Zero Hour. Today's episode brought to you in part by Metropolitan Life Insurance, Delco Batteries, and Bear Aspirin. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. You have been listening to The Zero Hour, a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System in association with Hollywood Radio Theater, heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again... Rest your eyes and listen here... To the Zero Hour... This is the Mutual Radio Network.